Good morning, Compass family. Hey, can you go ahead and stand up? Join us singing to our wonderful God. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my hiding place, so I believe in you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are. Every promise, through every breath I take, I believe that you are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. and sing this out. It's a new horizon. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you need me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you need me here today, with mercies that are new, all my fears and doubts, they can all come true, because they can't stay long, when I believe you are the way, the truth.
see. Thanks. Hey, well, good morning. Welcome to Compass. You glad to be here today? All right. Well, hey, we just want to welcome you here. If you're new, we really want to welcome you in as our guest. Uh, there is a new here card in the seat back in front of you, and we'd love for you to fill that out, take it to the living room, uh, receive a gift just for being our guest here today, but also hear about what your best next steps are uh, here at Compass. You know, we love to celebrate what God's doing. This last week, we had three people give their hearts to Christ in baptism, so some pictures are going to come up there on the screen. So let's just celebrate that together and welcome them here at Compass. It's one of my favorite things. And another favorite thing I love is talking about the Dollar Club. And that's just a unique way we have here to help those in need and just see what God's going to do. If you don't know, the Dollar Club is where we ask everyone to give one extra dollar above what they would normally give. And then we take the accumulation of all that between all of our services and all of, all of our campuses. So the total attendance times one dollar. And then we help somebody in need connected to the Compass family. And this last week, we heard about a family that's dealing with just a, a roller coaster of life events. It really centers on the wife who has had cancer for, for many, many years. They received some good news a few years back that the cancer went into remission, uh, but the bad news is that recently they found out it has come back. And uh, even though they had some struggles with bills throughout the years, really this last bit of news has, has really hit them hard financially. And so we sat down with the family and, and found out how we can help and found out we could really pay down some bills that would help them with stress and really we'd share God's love with them. So because of our Dollar Club gift, we were able to help this family to the amount of $3,125. So thank you for being part of that. And today when the offering comes by, you can just drop a dollar in and that'll help a family just like that uh, this next week. Well, today's Father's Day. And I hope as a dad, when you pass the Father's Day station out front that had the bacon and the root beer, you were able to partake in that. If not, please do so on the way out. Uh, you can get some, and it's real good, thick, nice bacon. So we hope as dads, uh, you get to, to have some of that. But, you know, the Bible really honors the role of father. And so we just want to say that we love dads and we want to honor and celebrate you here today. And we want to do that a few ways. Uh, one, of the, one of the big ways is just for me to, to say right out front that uh, as a dad, uh, we are so special that we have a whole line of jokes named just after us. You know, the, the famous dad jokes. And so uh, in that vein, I want you to watch the screen. You ready for this? As ready as I'm gonna be, okay. I'm reading a book about anti-gravity. I just can't put it down. No. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? Because the pee is silent. <laughs> Don't laugh at your own joke, Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> I like my joke. <laughs> my friend was telling me the other day, cheer up, man. It could be worse. You could be stuck underground in a hole full of water. I know he meant well. I told my son that I was named after Thomas Jefferson. He said, but dad, your name is Jesse. I said, I know, but I was named after Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> That's all that one coming. I feel like I, <laughs> that might have been a, I feel like I heard a laugh. A snortle? I, there was some sound. A cashier asked me the other day, would you like your milk in a bag, sir? I said, nah, just leave it in the carton. What's Forrest Gump's password? One forest, one. <laughs> I was gonna say, that one's really good. I had a dream last night that I was a muffler. I woke up exhausted. Yeah, nothing. Man, it's okay. the delivery. Yeah, huh? it's, it maybe it's your face. Okay, <laughs> so uh, here's another one. I was gonna tell a steak joke, but they're never well done. What did the buffalo say to his son when he dropped him off at school? What's up? Bye, son. <laughs> yeah. that was good. Yeah. I thought that might get you. Okay. We're running out of jokes, yeah, Jesse. I know. <laughs> we got two more. These are the these are the money no, makers. I only right got here. one more. Well, that's because you started first. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I just sold my vacuum. 
All it was doing was collecting dust. Yeah, see, you felt that one. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Did. Okay. Not a laugh, though. Okay. I just started this new band. It's called 1023 Megabytes. It's really good, but we don't have a gig yet. Yeah. That one made you think. That's a thinker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. All right, last one. This is it. This is for the gold. Yesterday, a clown held the door open for me. I thought it was a nice jester. Come on. Oh, I thought that was the money one right there. No. Nope. Okay. You saved the worst for last. <laughs> <laughs> yes! I what, what, what was it? One to zero? Oh, uh, did you laugh? I am. Yeah, I did. Okay. One time. Oh, that's right. That was that's for you. Cool. It was a pity laugh. Yeah, I won. Fair and square. Okay. There was a, a live studio audience that judged my victory. But I'm not gonna gloat with that until we, we meet shall again. meet again. Sam. That's my fourth time to see that video, and I'm just now getting some of those jokes. So, all right. Uh, if you're a dad, would you please stand up? We just want to take a moment and uh, honor you and celebrate you. Now, please, please stay standing. We actually have a prize up here for a, a special dad, so please stay standing. Now, you may be wondering what this is. It's not a, a bowling bag. It's actually a, a barbecue cooler, okay? So you can put, you know, meat in there as you're carrying it out there with you. And just let me tell you about some stuff that's, that's inside here. One is an apron that you can wear while you're barbecuing, and it says, uh, the man, dad, the man, the myth, the barbecue legend. So that's just to let people know who they're dealing with. And uh, we also have some barbecue sauce in here. This is a uh, mango pineapple hot sauce, okay? And it's a Christian uh, company. It's called Salvation Sauce. And it's got a little Bible on it too. You can, you can kind of read that while you're, uh, while you're grilling. And uh, we have a, a real size Bible, every man's Bible inside there. And then we also have a bunch of tools in there. There is a special set of tongs and uh, you know, forks and, and heating pad, all that kind of stuff. So anyway. So, somebody's going to get this, and the men's ministry wanted to do it this way. Whoever in, a dad in here has the most kids, all right? So, the most kids. There's already dad sitting down. Come on now, all right? Stay standing up, all right? So, most kids. Let's, let's start with four. If you have four or more kids, stay standing. Everybody else sit down, all right? Four or more. All right. Five or more, stay standing. Six or more, stay standing. Seven or more, stay standing. Is he our last man standing? All right, give him applause. Celebrate you. Come on up and get this gift. All right, start saving for college now, brother. All right, so congratulations. All right, so we just want to say uh, happy Father's Day uh, to everybody here. We also are excited that we're starting a brand new series today on the book of James. It's called Forged. Watch the screen. Good morning. Welcome to Compass. Uh, happy Father's Day, right? And we also want to welcome those who are joining us online. Happy Father's Day out there, too. Uh, grab your Bibles. Turn to James chapter 1. Uh, well, it is Father's Day weekend, and uh, we're all, you know, a lot of us wearing our jerseys, and no haters, I, but thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will treat him very well, and when he's in the Hall of Fame, we'll have a statue or a, or a jersey retirement at both places, Okay. Yeah, so. so I had a guy ask me not long ago, he said, how come on Mother's Day there's like a Mother's Day sermon, but then on Father's Day we're just like starting a series? I'm like, okay, so i got to compensate for that. So I brought a sword today. <laughs> that should do it, right? <laughs> hey, in the 1600s, the Japanese invented a rare forging process in the city of Kamani. 
uh, that they used to make samurai swords. And I know this is not a samurai sword, but they used it to make samurai swords. And they called those katanas. And the challenge that, that they were facing is they wanted a sword that would be both dependable and effective no matter what it had to endure. And so what they were looking for was a sword that would stay sharp, razor sharp in battle. And so they needed a very hard metal in, in order to, to hold that kind of edge. Uh, but they also wanted one that would be durable and flexible and, and effective that way. And so it was a technical challenge. You had to have hard steel uh, uh, for, um, for the sharpness of the blade, but you had to have softer steel for the flexibility. And so they had to come up with a solution, and they did. They developed this technological solution where they would take a rare sulfur-free ore, and they would heat it up to over 1,000 degrees. And they would put this in the furnace, they would heat it up, they would take it out, and then they would begin to fold it. And they would fold it over and over and over, sometimes hundreds of times. Then they would insert a, a hard metal core, then they would put it back in the furnace and heat it up again. And eventually, through that process, man, they're taking it out, it's hot, they're, you know, they're hammering that thing into place, they're, they're kind of molding that, that blade to make it exactly like they want. And with this rare forging process, they developed the samurai sword which was a sword that was, man, it, it was sharp, it had strength, but it was also flexible. And it became uh, a sword that they used to create a whole warrior class out of in Japan that lasted for hundreds of years. Now, here's what I want you to know about that, though. That sword didn't just happen, right? It, it didn't just happen by accident. It was forged, man. It, it took putting that sword in and out of the fire and shaping it on the anvil and and. Man, that forging process is what made that, that sword strong and flexible and resilient. And I don't think that's a far cry from the process that God puts his children through in order to make them strong and sharp and resilient. And listen, any, anybody that's read the Scripture very long knows that the Scripture teaches this is normal for any follower of Jesus Christ. This is just what God does. So over the next few weeks... We're going to walk verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, right through the book of James. James is the brother of Jesus. This has been called one of the most practical books, easy to understand books in the Bible. So here's what I want to encourage you to do as we go through this process. We're going to unpack how God forms Christ in us, and it's a forging process. And in order to understand this well and make sure we're all on the same page as a church, especially in the summer, right, I want to encourage you to read Whatever text we're studying for the weekend, James 1 this weekend, read that, that text every day until we meet again. Now, if you're only here 1.4 times a month, you're going to be reading James 1 for a long time. But if you're back next week, we're going to be in chapter 2, okay? So James chapter 1, read it every day. Where do I read? I don't know what I'm doing. Where's my quiet time going to be? You know, well, now you know. James chapter 1, just read that every day, once a day, all week long, and let's allow God to, like, plant that deeper in our hearts so that we're not just hearers of the word, we're what? The doers of the word. Great. Max Lucado tells a funny story in his book, In the Eye of the Storm. He writes, Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage, the next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. But the phone rang, and she turned to pick it up, and she had barely said hello when shoop, Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum, opened the bag. There was Chippy, still alive, but stunned. And since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him, raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. Realizing that Chippy was now uh, uh, soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would have done. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted the little parrot with, or parakeet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him, he writes. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. Chippy just sits and stares. <laughs> Not hard to see why, he writes. Sucked in, washed up, and blown over. That's enough to steal the song from the stoutest of hearts. And you know what? Uh, sucked in, washed up, blown over. I believe that's how a lot of us have felt at certain times in our lives. And that's why I'm so glad that James starts his book the way he does. He's writing to Christians in the midst of persecution, 
in the midst of trials and testing, and he starts with with just a great reminder of of why we go through those things. So grab your Bibles, James chapter 1. Listen, if you don't have a Bible, let me get one for you so that that you can take home the Word of God and so that you can actually read James 1 every day this week. And you just need to have that with you so you can study with us. And James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does." But blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has prepared to those who love him. Now, in the first paragraph of this book, James, the brother of Jesus, is talking about the kind of testing, this kind of trial, right, that the Christians were having to endure in that day. And he speaks of it in these words, he, that it's not only normal, right, right? but that an attitude of joy could actually be maintained as they were working through this forging process, right? And, and we're not talking about some fake, I know I lost my job today, but everything's going to be great. Something good's going to happen to me today. That's phony. But a joy and a confidence that God is going to be with me no matter what, and his presence and his strength is sufficient to stabilize me through any trial. Now, friends, that teaching is a long, long way from the shallow, popular teachings of our day, right? Give your heart to Jesus and everything will be fine kind of religion. That's not what the Bible says. Come to Jesus. You'll never get sick. Come to Jesus. Everything in your life will be wonderful. You'll have plenty of money. Your kids won't give you any trouble, right? God will put a force field around your life and grant you three wishes a day and be the best friend you ever had. And, of course, when they say best friend, they mean that friendship is interpreted to mean that God's going to guarantee an easy life. And friends, God does not promise that in his word. In fact, I want to say this right up front as we start this series. God's number one purpose in your life is to make you like Jesus. God's number one purpose. And if God is going to make you like Jesus and he's going to make me like Jesus, then guess what? He's probably going to have to put us through some things that Jesus himself went through. And you think about his life. There were times when Jesus was lonely, times when he was tired, There were times when he was tempted and frustrated and discouraged. And the Bible's teaching us here that through that kind of testing, God can develop believers who are strong and sharp and resilient. And James is going to give us, as we walk through this text today, some essentials for victory when we're in the middle of those trials. So let's talk about those three big ideas, and here's the first one. He first reminds us that we need to consider carefully our circumstances. You need to consider carefully your circumstances. In fact, in verse 2, that's what he says. He says, count it all joy or consider it pure joy. Now, that word consider there is an accounting term. So basically, he's saying take stock of, consider carefully, investigate fully, line all the numbers up, and then add them all up. It's an accounting term. And so he's asking us to consider something. What are the things that James, the brother of Jesus, is asking us to consider? Well, I think he's asking us to consider the facts about the trials of life. And so let me just give you those those facts that he's asking us to consider. Number one, he just says right up front, trials are inevitable. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that today, but trials are inevitable. One thing is certain, and Jesus said it himself in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. Now, the Scripture doesn't say if you face trials, Consider it pure joy, right? It says, whenever you face trials, you can count on it. You're going to have problems. Nobody is exempt. If Jesus himself was not exempt, then why should we think that we would be? So now James, as you think about his life, he had a ton of personal experience with trials. As the brother of Jesus, he would have had a ringside seat to see the unfair treatment and all the difficulties that Jesus was put through in his three-year ministry on the earth. In fact, since James was not even a believer until after the resurrection, you knew that, right? Like James, the half-brother of Jesus, he doesn't even believe his brother's the son of God, thinks he's crazy until after the resurrection. He probably helped put some of those difficulties and trials on his own brother. 
There was no force field of protection around Jesus. And then James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem when the persecution broke out. He was there when Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was murdered, stoned to death in the street, and left for dead. He saw that happen. That must have been tough. He was there doing God's work when Saul singled out all the Christians for extermination. He would later become the Apostle Paul, but when he was Saul, he was a mean man. He was there when James, son of Alphaeus, one of the other apostles, was put to death with the sword. He saw believing families and church leaders flee Jerusalem when the persecution broke out in Acts chapter 8. He chaired the first church council in Acts chapter 15, which was a pretty tense congregational meeting to have to oversee. So when James says, when you face trials, he's not speaking in some theoretical way where he's talking about somebody else. He's speaking from experience in his own life. Friends, the church in that day was living through persecution and testing and trials. It was happening. So he says, listen, trials are inevitable. Here's the second thing. Write it down. Trials are unpredictable. Look at the next word there in the text. He says, whenever you face trials. And that word face in the Greek is the word peripipto. And that word means to fall into unexpectedly. And so it's the exact same word that was used Remember in the parable of the Good Samaritan when it says he fell among the thieves or he fell among the robbers? He fell into that unexpectedly. He, he wasn't planning for that that day, right? So when the Bible says you're going to fall into various testing and trials in your life, the picture of the phrase is interesting because the language literally means that it's an unavoidable situation. The Bible actually teaches that you are going to fall into trials, tempting, testing in your life, And that that's going to come to your life no matter how good you are. That they're going to come into your life circumstances that will try your very soul. And the picture here that that we see is actually of someone who's walking along and they're walking along quite well, everything's fine. All of a sudden they hit a slick spot. And they fall and they trip and they hurt themselves. That's, That's what the image is. Now if you've ever been on slick ice, and if you've gone ice skating here in Phoenix maybe, or if you've gone up north... The flagstaff, when it snowed and, and there's ice on the ground, it doesn't matter how careful you are, doesn't matter how, sh- how sure-footed you might be, right? You hit that slick place on the ground, you're going down. The only thing you can do is hit the ground. And I just have a feeling, he's talking about, it's unexpected, man, that nobody ventures out of their home, nobody living up in Flagstaff when it snows said to his wife, honey, I'm, I'm going to go out and check the mail and I'm going to plan on falling and breaking my leg. I'll be right back. <laughs> nobody says that. The Bible says that is a picture of your trials. It's not that there's anything you can do preventative to keep those things from coming into your life. There's no use trying. You're going to encounter trials. Now, I think we can all deal with that. That's hard, but I think that's something we can deal with. The second thing he says, though, is pretty hard. He says, when those trials come, when you face those trials, count it all joy. Consider it pure joy. Now, I don't mind, you consider it pure joy when adversity and trials and suffering and pain comes into your life? Man, we consider it pure misery. And yet James says, when you fall into various trials and circumstances, count it all joy, brothers and sisters. Now, that's hard to do, man. That goes against every natural inclination and instinct that we have. So, so what's God doing here? What's happening through these times of trials and testing? Well, I believe that he is forging a community of highly committed, perfectly prepared people of his to go into his world and transact kingdom business for him. That's what's happening through trials. Now, let me ask you, how many of you know how many missionaries we have? Anybody? Think about it. Wait, wait, 10, 15, 20, how many? How many? You know, anybody know? 3,500. Now, now, we've got several hundred people, and I, I'm so glad for this, that are actually here checking out church trying to figure out who Jesus is, trying to figure out what it would look like to maybe step across the line of faith and put their faith in Jesus. And, man, I'm so glad you're with us. Welcome. This is a safe place. Our mission here at Compass is to lead people to find and follow Jesus. And so we're all about helping people with those tough questions, and we're, we're glad that you've, you felt like this is a safe place to be. But we've got at least over 3,000 of us who are missionaries. You know that you were not forged. You were not created by God. His purpose for your life was not that you can get connected to Jesus and get your sins forgiven and then show up to church 1.4 times a month. Did you know that? Did you know that his purpose for your life was, hey, you're saved now. If you just read the Bible and pray and go to a Bible study, that's my purpose for your life. You know that's not what he says, right? 
You know it's not his purpose. And he doesn't say, you show up to church and you sing a few songs, study the Bible, come back next week. That's my purpose for your life. That's not God's purpose for your life. Friends, you are a missionary in your city. You were put here on purpose and for a purpose. And God's deep desire for you is that you actually become a disciple, right? That's what he wants. Not Christians who go to Bible studies. He wants a disciple. And a disciple is someone who follows Jesus and who is being changed by Jesus, right? And then who goes and lives out the mission of Jesus in the world. So if you're going to be true to what he's trying to forge you into, then you're going to be a missionary in your city. You're going to go to your, your friends on your soccer team and, and your classmates at school and, and your coworkers and your neighbors across the street that you never talked to, right? And you're going to have those conversations and you're going to be that missionary. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to make a people of his who are strong and sharp and flexible. And he wants us ready. And so what that means is, if he has to let us go through some hard stuff in order to get us ready... He's willing to do it. So times of testing and trial are not only inevitable and they're not only unpredictable, but here's the third thing James says. He says trials are of many kinds. So they come in all shapes and sizes. One thing about problems, you're never going to get bored with them. There's a wide variety of them, right? Hey, have you ever tried to match paint at, at your house without going to Home Depot? You're like, oh, yeah, I got this, man. Oh, yeah, right? Well, that's kind of what the word means in the Greek. Many kinds literally means multicolored. So there are problems of many shades, many varieties. They vary in type. They vary in intensity. They vary in duration. Some are just minor inconveniences, and some are major crises. But they're of many kinds, which is why I'm glad he says this next thing. Here's the next point to write down. Trials are not permanent. Aren't you glad for that? They're not permanent. Three senior citizens were golfing together, and two of them griped endlessly. The fairways are too long, said one. The greens are too fast, said the other. The, the first one said, again, the bunkers are too deep. And finally, the third man had had enough, and he said, at least we're on this side of the grass, right? <laughs> That's a pretty good perspective. Mark Lowry, the Christian comedian, says his favorite verse in the Scripture is Luke chapter 2, verse 1, which says, and it came to pass. He says, if it came to pass, it didn't come to stay. And that's what James actually says about trials, aren't you glad? But here's the last thing, and I want us to really focus in on this one as we keep going today. Number five, write this down. Trials are purposeful. Trials are purposeful. All right, we've made it down to verse 3, so look at verse 3. He says, when you encounter these trials of many kinds, when you face them, consider it pure joy. And here's why he says that. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So here's what we learn right there. Trials have a purpose, that pain can actually be productive, that suffering can actually accomplish something in our lives. It has value in our lives. Now, friends, this is the Job scenario, isn't it? Job, the godly man, suffers. He thinks it's unfair. He knows it's inexplicable, and he wants to know why. And yet God's not talking. God's not answering his questions. You have to get all the way to chapter 38 in the book of Job before you see God start to answer Job's questions. And he really doesn't answer his questions. He just says, hey, brace yourself like a man. You're going to answer me now, right? So if you read the book of Job, it's, it's pretty amazing. And in the middle of all that, Job's friends say, God hates you. And he says, no, this is not a predictable trial. I didn't do anything to cause this to come into my life. And Job's wife, God love her, says, God hates you. Curse him and die. Hate him back. Works for me. And Job says, woman, you can't know God and hate God. Something else is happening. Something else beyond my <laughs> understanding. And eventually, he doesn't understand. And so Job, in chapter 13, verse 15, says this. It's an amazing statement. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Even if he decides to take me out, my only, only logical thought that I can have, and it doesn't seem logical if you're not a Christian, he said, I'm going to keep trusting him anyway because he's a good father. And so the book of Job ends with Job knowing that he can trust God, knowing for sure that he will sustain him through any time of testing and trial. He knows God on a deeper level than ever before, and it's not some theoretical thing. He knows him by experience. He knows that he knows. And in the last chapter of that book, he says, my ears had heard of you, 
And many of us, oh, yeah, I've heard about God. I know about Jesus. But I, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He said, Lord, I know you now in ways I've never known you before and couldn't have known you without going through all this. And he repents of any doubt or disappointment or anger with God because you have those reactions sometimes because you just don't understand who God really is. Somebody said, Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what's inside of them until you drop them in hot water. And then it comes out, right? Then you know. Friends, your faith develops when things don't go as planned, right? Your faith develops when you don't feel like doing what's right, but do it anyway. Christians are like steel. They're tested, and they come out stronger. So, in fact, write this down. Tested faith is proven faith. You want to see if your faith is real? Go through a time of testing and trial. Tested faith is proven faith. And James says, you'll be perfect. Now, that doesn't mean perfection. In the Greek, that word means fully mature. When endurance has its perfect result in your life, when you have persevered through the trial, you will lack nothing. And listen, if God is letting you go through a trial to improve something in your character, if you bail out, your growth stops right there. Can't go any further until you come back and enter back in and walk with the Lord through that thing and fix those issues, deal with them. He says, perseverance must finish its work. And if you don't persevere, then the forging, right, doesn't get finished. You bail out. The process is over. But that's God's long-range goal for you. His ultimate purpose is maturity. God wants you to grow up in your Christian life. And that's why our mission is, is just like the Great Commission that Jesus gave us. We lead people to find and follow Jesus, right? We don't say, well, great, you found Jesus. God bless you. Next. We don't do that. We, we want you to grow up, and the Bible actually says, become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great thing? In fact, that's where the word predestined is in the Scripture. It says he is predestined. You go, oh, predestination. No, it says he is predestined you to what? To be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's God's ultimate goal for you. So that means that God is more interested in building my character than he is making me comfortable. Right? He, he wants to build my character. If he's building my character, I'm going to have to go through the forging process. And every person here today can think of a trial or a time of testing or a time of suffering and pain that you've gone through. And if I ask you, hey, would you want to go through that again? You'd say, no way. And I would too. But if I ask you a follow-up question, if I said, are you grateful, though, for what that difficulty accomplished in your life because of what God did in your life? Not all of us would say yes because many of us bailed out. But a great number of us would say, I wouldn't trade those lessons and the character that got developed in those hard times for anything. And that's why James says we can consider it all joy. We consider it all joy because James teaches us that when those tough times come, the end result is going to be perseverance and maturity and transformation of my character. And I'm going to look more like Jesus. So the first thing we learn is that we need to consider carefully our circumstances, our trials. We need to understand the facts about what's really going on. But here's the second thing. Once you understand all that, you still got to do some things. Number two, you need to submit and surrender your situation. And here's what I mean by that. God cannot and he will not build our character without our cooperation, right? He's a gentleman. He's not going to push and prod and, and, and drag and, you know, pull you in against your own will. If we resist him, there are going to be natural consequences. It will be his discipline sometimes. But when we submit to him and trust him and surrender in that situation, he can accomplish his work in us. That's what he's teaching here. I think of a couple little illustrations in my own life with, with my kids. I'll use both kids today. Is that okay? <laughs> so I remember Sydney, when she was a little, little girl, she got a, a speck of dirt, like, almost like a piece of wood, like stuck in her eye. And, man, she was scared, and it was hurting, and you couldn't keep your eye open because it hurt, and you couldn't shut your eye because it hurt, and she didn't know what to do. And, and I, and I'm her father. I love her. I, I, she can trust me. And I was saying, trust me. I can help you with this, but i got to get in there, right? you got to let me in your eye. Like, yeah, right? Like, who's going to do this, right? So it, it took her a minute to kind of believe that was going to be true, but, but then she trusted me, and I got in there, man, and I got it out. And she was so relieved. 
But I couldn't do that without her cooperation. She had to surrender and submit. I, I think of Sophie, when she's about four years old, we lived in St. Louis, and she, she found one of those little baby rings, you know what I'm talking about? Like, we got that at like a, a baby shower or something. She found a little baby ring, and she thought, oh, I'm going to put that on my finger. And, and four years old, I mean, she's just a little kid. So she puts it on, and it's on there. It is not coming off. She's at home with Sydney and with Marie, and they try everything. They try to get it off, and it doesn't work. So, they, you know, soap and lotion, but everything you can do, it is not coming off. And her finger is getting red, and she's getting scared, right? And so, like, call daddy. And so they call me at work, and, and I come home, and I walk in, and you can just see on everybody's face, but especially on Sophie's, man, she is scared. And so I, I said, you, you know, I'm your daddy. I love you. You can trust me. I'm going to cut it off. Not your finger, right? She's four years old. <laughs> but, but the ring. And so she's scared, and, and it's, it's bad. And so she gives me her hand, and it took some work, man, and it was hard. But we got it cut enough that we could get it off. And when it came off her finger, man, oh, she, she was so grateful. But I couldn't have done that without her cooperation. Friends, God doesn't work in us without our consent. We have to surrender and submit our will to his. And if we trace uh, if we face trials without a surrendered will, then the Bible teaches here that we're going to remain immature infants, right? But that if we actually submit and we, we, res- we don't resist, we, we surrender our will to him, that he can do his work in us. And in the middle of all that, James gives us a great response. He says, here's what you should do. If you believe all those things are true and you're trying to lean in, here's what you should do. You should pray. You should pray For wisdom. Look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Now, note it doesn't say your trial is going to end because of your prayers. It just says if you lack wisdom to see the trials the way that God sees them, to understand what he's trying to accomplish and the value of these times in your life, go to God, ask him for wisdom, you'll get it. So, friends, when you pray, you are not promised that your trial is going to go away. But you are, listen, promised wisdom. And I love the way James says it, liberally, in full measure, without finding fault. Don't you like that part? I don't know if I can go to God, man. I can't ask God for anything. Look at what I'm doing. Look at my life. Look at how things are going. He's not going to hear from me. He's not going to give me anything. Without finding fault, no begging required. He's ready, he's willing to give you all the wisdom you need from his endless supply if you'll just ask. I think that's what happened for Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, right? We read the account of Solomon, King David's son. King David, greatest king in Israel. He's going to follow his dad, right? And and God comes to him as a really young man and he says, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And we read the account of Solomon not asking for money and not asking for long life but asking for a wise and discerning heart or a wise and understanding heart because he's getting ready. Man, I'm telling you, I know he loved the Lord. (laughs) This sounds like a spiritual thing he did, but I don't think he was a spiritual giant. I think he was desperate. He's getting ready to follow the most successful king in the whole world. David was the consummate warrior and poet and politician. Everything he did turned to gold. And now Solomon is about to have the reins of a very complex kingdom placed in his hands. And so he doesn't pray for money because he knows there's not enough money in the whole world to help him if he blows it. And he doesn't pray for long life because the last thing in the world he wants is to live a long time if he drops the ball as king. And so he prays for what he needs the most. Wisdom. Discernment. The ability to understand what to do, when to do it, how to do it in the midst of his current trials. And he finds that God is gracious And God is generous, and he's willing to give liberally without finding fault. And because he asked for such a a good thing, God gave him the other things as well. You know, if you work on this perspective for a while, you might find that you're just able to, to make any situation in your life, no matter what it is, you can take any situation and find yourself with the ability to turn it into an opportunity to praise your God and an opportunity to pursue his will on earth. In fact, I would say it like this. You just might begin to realize that we are regularly facing wonderful learning opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And that's certainly what they feel like in the moment, right? But God says, listen, listen, it may feel impossible, but these are great learning 
opportunities for you. Billy Graham once said, mountaintops are for views and inspiration, but real fruit is grown down in the valleys. That's true. John Eldridge tells the story of a Scottish discus thrower from the 19th century. Now, he lived in the days before professional trainers, and he had to train all by himself up in the highlands. He made his own discus from a description he read in a book. Now, what he didn't know was that the competition discus was made of wood with an outer rim of iron. His discus was made of pure metal, four times heavier than the ones that would be used by his would-be challengers. This committed Scotsman trained day after day, laboring under the burden of extra weight. He marked off that record distance, and he worked and worked and worked and threw and threw and threw. I know it's not how you throw a discus. Until, <laughs> until he could throw it the record distance. Of course, when he arrived at the competition, he was handed the official wooden discus, and he threw it like a tea saucer. He set new records, and those were records that were held by him for many, many, many years. And as Eldridge reflected on that story, he said, so that's how you do it. Train under a great burden. Train under a heavy burden. And some of us here today, if we're honest, we would just admit, and it's hard to admit it, but we're training right now. Man, we are going through the forging process. We are training under a great burden. And it hurts. And sometimes we cry and sometimes we despair and sometimes we're angry at the burden. But we must always take heart. In fact, James goes so far as to say we must maintain a sense of joy in the midst of that. Because that burden is producing perseverance. And that perseverance is producing maturity. Neither of these virtues so prized by God could ever be ours without the burden. I love the way the message paraphrases this, verses 3 and 4. It says, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and it shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. That's God's goal for your life. Okay, now look one last time at verse 12. So we kind of wrap this up because I don't want you to miss this last point. So important. Verse 12. In fact, so important, I want to have us read it aloud together. Ready? Here we go. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You know what he's saying here? Write this down. Envision your eternity. Friends, you realize that this life is not all there is. And as Christians, we can't let the trials and the pain and the suffering of our life cause us to lose our perspective. This world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we may have to go through intense trials and pain and suffering or even persecution in this life, maybe all our lives. And yet we remember how Jesus finishes his sentence in John 16, He says, in this world, you will have trouble. But what does he say after that? But take heart. I have overcome the world. Boy, that's true. I've been reflecting a lot because it's Father's Day weekend. And I heard a story one time in North Carolina of a pastor that was telling me that they went into the prisons there and Hallmark went with them. And it was Mother's Day and Mother's Day coming up. And so Hallmark sold cards to all the prisoners to, to give to their mothers. You know how many cards they sold for Mother's Day? 2,500. Everybody writing cards. Mom, I love you. Mom, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. They came back in. They thought, this is great. We're going to make lots of money. They came back in for Father's Day. Guess how many cards for Father's Day they, they sold? One. Does that tell you anything about the lack of, of fathers, the lack of guidance that people have in our world today? I had the privilege of being in Chicago this past week. Um, I'm taking some classes with Wheaton College. Um, uh, it's a pastor's cohort several of us together doing this, to get a master's. I already have a master's. I, I'm not, I wasn't trying to get another master's. But to be in the class with these guys and to learn from some of the resources we're being given, books that aren't even out yet, and, and, and seeing some of these churches, our elders heard about this. They said, do it. So that's what I'm doing. And I was there this past week, and I had two days of classes on Wheaton's campus. And then we went downtown to some real churches in some real places in Chicago. And one of those churches was called New Life. And I met a guy who gave his testimony, and his name is Jorge. Here's his picture. Just keep it up while I tell his story. So I met Jorge. 
Jorge grew up in that neighborhood, and it was a very, very hard neighborhood that he grew up in. In, in, in fact, it was so bad that they had what they called the red line, and the red line separated this gang from this gang. And if you're part of this group and you show up over that red line, you're dead, right? And so he saw many of his friends get shot, killed right in front of him. He got involved in the gangs because he had no father in his life. He got involved in the gangs. He got involved with drugs and alcohol. Eventually, he found himself in prison. And he said something, one phrase that just stood out so much to me when he was sharing his story. He said, I had a man who walked with me. I had a man, no father, but I had a man who walked with me. A man came into his life that loved him in spite of all his mess and all his failures and all his sin. This man told him about Jesus. This man helped him step across the line of faith and put his faith in this Jesus. He shared that love with him. He, he didn't just leave him there, though. He didn't say, God bless you next. He helped him not just find Jesus, but follow Jesus. He walked with him through a discipleship process to help him grow up in Jesus. And you know what they call Jorge as a volunteer in that church today? A street pastor. You know what a street pastor does in that church? Anytime there's a shooting, anytime there's big crime or violence in that city, which is very often, in fact, last week, before we got there, three eighth graders were shot within 500 yards of that church. You know what they do when something like that happens? They have a team of people that used to live that life, but now they know Jesus. And half of that team shows up at the hospital for those families. Sometimes they're planning funerals. They've been a part of 125 funerals for kids since he joined that ministry as a volunteer. Sometimes they're praying for healing, and they're with those families in those moments of, of pain and uncertainty. You know what the rest of the group does with Jorge? They go to the scene of the crime. And because they've been there, they know how to deal with this. And they walk into that situation right after the crime has taken place. And, man, they start to talk to those gangs. And they, they start to cross over on both sides of those lines and have conversations with those kids. And they prevent the next murder from taking place out of retaliation. And they're making a difference. They're bringing the light of Jesus into a dark place in that city. But, friends, it wasn't easy for him. He had to go through a forging process. He had to go through many trials in his life as he was figuring this out. But he had somebody that walked with him through that process and reminded him of these things that James is reminding us of today. And even though his life was very hard, and even though you could look back and go, wow, look what that guy had to go through, here's what he learned. <laughs> trials are not like dry erase markers. You can't just wipe them away. But they're also not like permanent markers or tattoos, right? They won't last forever. They may leave scars. We may look back and it, it, it's hurtful. But he learned that he has a Savior, and so do we, who has wounded hands and wounded feet, who knows what it's like to go through pain and suffering and testing and trials. And yet he wants to heal our hearts. And because of what Jesus has overcome on the cross, sin and death and hell, these trials that we face in this life are just really small compared to eternity. In fact, I love the way Paul sums it up in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He wrote, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, friends, I don't know when you walked in here today what you're going through. I don't know what kind of trial or testing or temptation or pain or suffering you might find yourself in today. But here's what I know. If you bail out, God can't do anything in your life. Your growth stops right there. But if you will trust your good Father and you will surrender and submit to His will and let Him do His good work in you and let Him take you through that forging process, then those times of trial, you can actually consider them pure joy because they're producing perseverance. And that perseverance is producing maturity. When it finishes its work, you will be fully mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's God's desire for you. And one day, for those of us who trust Him and submit to His will, there will be a crown of life that He has promised for those who love Him. There will be an eternity where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain or suffering or testing or trials. And friends... I would just encourage you, lean in. Trust your good father. 
don't bail out. And see what he can accomplish in your life as he forges you and and conforms you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being with us through the trials of life. Lord, sometimes it feels like we're alone. Sometimes it feels like we have no answers. And yet we can trust that we have a good father who loves us. And and you're not going to force us to cooperate with you, but if we will surrender and submit to you, you will do amazing things in our lives, just like you did with my friend Jorge. And so God, give us the vision to understand our trials and our testing the way you see those things. Help us to understand that, that Lord, they're not going to last forever, but while they are lasting, if we will lean in and we will trust you, that you will do things in us that you could not do otherwise, and we will know you in a way that we could not know you unless we'd gone through those things give us courage to act today as you're calling us to to do certain things help us to summon our courage and and take a step and be with us give us that courage and give us that peace that we need as we walk through the trials of life we pray in jesus name amen well friends we're going to sing a song right now we're going to have prayer partners come up here on either side of this stage and as we sing if you're going through something and you need some encouragement and some prayer, some trial, some difficulty, just walk forward, connect with a prayer partner, let us pray for you. We'd love to, They're praying that people will come to pray with them today. And maybe you've never stepped across the line of faith and you've never given your heart and your life to Jesus. You've never initially submitted your will to His. And if you haven't done that, you don't have the one who can walk with you through the pain and the suffering of life. You don't have the one who understands the suffering and can bring courage and peace into your life. And maybe you want to give your heart and your life to him. Come to Jesus and admit that you have a need, that you you can't fix it, right? You have a sin problem like we all do, and the only Savior who can take care of that sin problem is him. And if you're ready to admit that today and, and ask for his forgiveness and step across that line of faith, be baptized into him, your life will change forever. So if you're ready to do that, man, just walk across the room. Summon your courage. Don't believe the lies of the evil one. Don't believe the lies of this world. He'll give you the courage to do it. But let's stand right now as we sing this song. If you have a decision to make, walk across the room, and we'll help you every step of the way.
As we come to this really special time of communion, you know, we're going to pass these trays and we take the bread and we dip it in the juice. And these things are emblems, they're symbols that represent what Jesus did for us. And this is really a time to stop and remember the sacrifice that he made for us up there on the cross so that we could have hope and we could have forgiveness. And today we've been talking about trials. And during this time of communion, I want you to stop and and really connect with Jesus personally and to remember he gave up his life for us, yes, but he also came and and became a human, a person. And he knows what it's like to go through trials. He knows what it's like to lose someone that he loves. He knows what it's like to be sinned against, to be lied to. He knows what it's like not to have very much. And the Bible talks about Jesus and that he's our perfect savior because he's a savior that can relate to us and we can relate to him. And so as we think about Jesus' trial, we realize that his trials led him to his death, which God used the purpose of his death to save us so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could have hope, so we could have eternal life. So during this time of communion, we just want you to take this, remember his death, and stop and connect to Jesus on a personal level and realize that he understands the trials that we go through here today. And just thank him that he's a savior that we can come to no matter what. After we take communion, we're going to take up an offering. And it's just a time to worship God as well, to to give back what God has given to us, to realize that just as Jesus sacrificed for us, we can worship him and we can be thankful and we can sacrifice to God so that other people can hear the good news that we ourselves have as well. And so that we can trust God in that and and trust that he's going to bless us and take care of us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time that we can continue to worship by remembering the, the death and sacrifice of Jesus and what that really means to us and that we can connect to Jesus as our personal Savior, one that, that totally understands, that gets it, that knows what we're going through. And Father, we thank you for that and we thank you for this time that we can trust you with what we give as well. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, hey, William, thank you for being here today. It's been great to, to worship together today, to hear from God's Word. I uh, love kicking off the book of James, and you know, I love that, that Brian mentioned reading through that together. As a matter of fact, uh, the discipleship team has put together a reading plan for us to go through together. And so if you just text the number that's going to come up on the screen, text the word James to that number, you will receive a text every day that has the section of Scripture to read for that day. And then if you want a printed copy instead of a, a digital copy, you can pick one up at the Welcome Center out in the lobby or on the, on the patio, there, our ministry tent area. You can pick one up there and take it and, and just read every day. But, you know, as we think about the summer reading list, and, and we just want to make sure that we have a steady diet of God's Word uh, during this summer. It would be awesome. Also, if you're new here, as I mentioned, we'd love for, for you to fill out one of those new here cards and on the seat backs in front of you, just so we can get to know you as you're getting to know us. Also, you can take it out to the living room as a gift for you and some people to help you figure out what your best next step is to get connected here and to grow spiritually. Uh, after the service is over, we'll have some prayer partners up here at the front. So if you need prayer, we'd love for you to come up and share that with us so we can pray with you and, and pray over you. So once again, we want to thank you for being here. And as we go out, let's remember what we do. We love God. We love people. We share Jesus. God bless. Have a great day.